That is not it. Yes, that is it. That is not it. Okay. I'm coming. Let me just get where I need to be. Ah, there it is. Got it. All right. Is this it? This is it. Got it. All right. So, um, freed slaves, of course, are um, freed with the end of the Civil War and with the um, ratification of the 13th Amendment. And there's some issues. They have problems. They're homeless. They're hungry. There's not enough food. There's not enough food in the South to feed the population, much less people who are not used to having to find their own food. They're uneducated. And their lack of education will lead to their lack of employment. And it's kind of a strange statement to make, but they're free for the first time. And that's a problem. Why do you think that's so? Uh... Okay. And, and quite simply, they don't know how to live as free people. They've never been free. And so it's strange to them. Um, they don't own anything. And because they don't own anything, um, most freedmen begin working as either tenant farmers or sharecroppers. And we'll talk about those later today. And, and quite honestly, they live in fear of being re-enslaved. I mean, look at the U.S. government's track record. Think about how they treated the Native Americans. They kept promising, yep, we're going to take care of you. We're going to be your allies. We're not going to let anybody harm you. And then what do they do? They do the ones who were harming, right? They place them in situations that really aren't that much different than slavery. Um, and then uh, something that, that Ian alluded to just a moment ago, there's this whole idea of black and white having to learn how to live together in a way that they never have before. And so freedom does not necessarily come without difficulties, without problems. One of the things that helps is called the Freedmen's Bureau, and I think we mentioned this the other day. We didn't talk in any great detail about it, but we did mention it. The Freedmen's Bureau began as the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, 1865. As the war is ending, the Freedmen's Bureau is coming into existence. Its primary goal is to help feed the poor, to help not just feed the poor, but house them and give them clothing. Not just former enslaved people, but all poor people living in the South, white and black. <clears throat> as it evolves, as it changes through the years, it becomes more about education. Some 4,000 or so primary or elementary schools are established. Trade schools are established. What's the importance of a trade school? or in this case, an industrial school, but it's the same thing. Yeah, we're going to teach you some job skills. It's kind of like going to a technical college today. You learn a trade, and then you can market that trade. And also, they begin to train teachers, black teachers to teach black students. And there was actually, and I haven't shared this with anybody else today, but um, heard this over the summer, and once upon a time, it was said that children, black sh children, should be taught in their own schools. So it was kind of pushing, and this is the federal government, kind of pushing for um, segregation. They should be taught in their own schools by their own kind, and I, I hate to say it that way, but it's basically what it's saying, by black teachers. Therefore, um, black schools have more control over their curriculum than they would if they were all white or if they had white teachers and were controlled by white um, folks. Um, schools like Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Spelman, Clark, all are created during Reconstruction by the Freedmen's Bureau and the church. Um, because, again, the only way to help a people come out of 
extreme poverty and extreme oppression is through education. That's one reason slave owners didn't want slaves to be educated, because they knew it would eventually lead to their freedom. So, um, all that takes time, right? I mean, you don't suddenly free four and a half million people and they all become employable with marketable skills. That takes time. In the meantime, those freedmen are having to choose. Do we leave the South or do we stay? Well, most of them have to stay because they can't afford to leave the South. And they become one of two things. They become a tenant farmer or they become a sharecropper. And trust me when I say that one of those is worse than the other. Tenant farming, you own something. You own the equipment, you own your tools, you own an animal or two. Um, you just don't have any land. And so what do you do? You enter into an agreement with the landowner to release or to rent land so that you can farm. What's it going to cost you? 25% of your crop. That was the going rate. A sharecropper, on the other hand, owned nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing. And so his agreement with the landowner was 50% of the crop because the landowner is having to provide everything, seed, animals, equipment, tools, a house, everything. And so his portion is about 50%, which is worse, to be a sharecropper or a tenant farmer? By far. And what we are, we are about to see, I think it's actually there in your notes, is we're about to see that sharecropping becomes slavery by another name. It becomes a cycle of poverty. So even though the sharecropper is not owned by another man, he in essence is owned by another man because he's indebted to it. And it will work something like this. The sharecropper... Um, is provided with land, he's provided with seed, with everything he needs to farm. And in return, 50% of his crop. That's okay, if that's all it was. But that's not all it is. Because he's got to eat, right? His children need clothes. He's got to have a place to live. And so he buys on credit from the landowner. Why? Because it's convenient. And the landowner will let him do it. So he buys on credit over a year. In the meantime, he's planting, he's harvesting. He goes to the landowner, gives him his crops. Was that a mistake? Yeah, because is the landowner going to treat him fairly? Probably not. It's probably going to be dishonest. Okay, But sharecropper's kind of stuck because he can't take those things to market and sell them. Only that landowner can. So he sells it, gets $1,000 for his crop. Let's just use nice round numbers. Gets 1000 bucks, okay? Which doesn't sound like a lot today, but, you know, that was pretty substantial. How much of it goes to the landowner? Half of it, which is 500 bucks. So landowner takes his 500 and the sharecropper is going to walk away happy, but then the landowner reminds him, hey, you still owe me some money. And he pulls out his records, and lo and behold, the sharecropper owes the landowner $600. Can he pay it? Nope. He's $100 in the hole. He's in debt, right? So next year, he can't pay off the debt, so he's got to work some more. So he works as a sharecropper, but this time instead of half of his crop, he's given... 75% of his crop. Same thing happens. He's got to eat. Children got to have clothes. Got to have a place to live. So at the end of the year, he's even deeper in debt. And if there is a tragedy, like the boll weevil shows up, he's even much more in the hole. Or there's drought, and his crops don't grow, he is in real trouble. And the point of it is, he never can get out of this. He can never pay off his debt. Because he can never pay off his debt, he is in a continual loop. You ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? Yeah. It's Groundhog Day all over again. 
the same thing year after year after year after year after year. He becomes a slave. He's not owned by another human being. He's a slave to debt. And he can't get out of it. And I don't know how many thousands of families this happened to. They became sharecropping families. It was passed down. It became generational. Daddy was a sharecropper. Son's a sharecropper. Son's a sharecropper. His son's a sharecropper. And and they never could get out. And so it's just slavery by another name. And we talked about a couple of other things. I think we talked about the convict lease system just briefly. Same kind of thing. So, um, 1865, the war's over. Georgia holds its constitutional convention. That's one of the things they have to do to be readmitted to the Union is create a new constitution. So, 1865, President Johnson appoints James Johnson, no relation, to be the provisional governor of Georgia. Provisional is just a fancy word for temporary until we can get somebody else. Johnson presides over the Constitutional Convention. Representatives vote to abolish slavery. They ratify the 13th Amendment. And they repeal the Ordinance of Secession. So the state of Georgia now says, wait a minute, we made a mistake. Gee, I wonder who said that before the Civil War. Was it Alexander H. Stevens that said this is a mistake? It sure was. And so... Elections are held in November of 1865. There are no black men that run for office. There are no black men that are elected to office. But um, freed men are given certain civil rights. They're not citizens, right? 14th Amendment hasn't been ratified. They're not able to vote because the 15th Amendment has not been ratified. But they do have some certain rights. Not a lot, but a few. 13th Amendment. This is kind of a cool document, um, and it's just, you know, I found it online somewhere. Um, it's a loyalty oath given by E.L. Felder from Houston County, Warner Robins, what's now Warner Robins. And it says, um, I, E.L. Felder of the county of Houston, the state of Georgia, do solemnly swear to affirm or affirm in presence of Almighty God, that I will henceforth faithfully defend the Constitution of the United States and the union of the states thereunder, and that I will in like manner abide by and faithfully support all laws and proclamations which have been made during the existing rebellion with reverence, reference rather to the emancipation of slaves. So help me God. And he signed it. That's August of 1865. And it basically says two things. Two Two. Those two things are this. I will defend the Constitution. By the way, that's the same oath that the President of the United States takes today. It's the same oath that um, military officers take. Do you know when an NCO re-enlists or when he enlists, do they take an oath? Okay. Be interested. Ask your dad tonight. Um, and, And if they do, then I'm sure it's very similar to what, you know, an officer in the military. They just swear to defend the Constitution of the United States. Not to defend the country, not to defend the people, to defend the Constitution. Um, And so that's one thing. The other thing is that this man promised um, to support all the laws that have emancipated or will emancipate or free slaves. It's only two things. And that's very simple, isn't it? And so upon signing that, E.L. Felder became a citizen of the United States again. Pretty simple. Got another one. This is my, this is my great-grandfather's loyalty oath from 1867. What happened in 1867? The Reconstruction Act of 1867 is enacted, signed into law. So... Radical Reconstruction really starts. And it's different. Now, um, I'm not going to read all that to you. That's a lot to read, a lot to remember. But down here, the last line, it says, I will faithfully support the Constitution and obey the laws of the United States 
and will to the best of my ability encourage others so to do, so help me God. That sounds an awful lot like what Mr. Felder had to say, right? In sign. But then there's all this other stuff up here. Basically what it says is that um, I did not participate in the rebellion. I was never elected to an office, um, either state or federal, and then participated in the rebellion. Um, I've never given aid or comfort, comfort to the enemy. I have never been a member of Congress or an officer of the United States or any state legislature and then committed treason. doesn't use the word treason, but that's what it means. Never done that. And so my great-grandfather in July of 1867 signs that. Wow, technically he didn't sign it. Why? What do you know about my great-grandfather already? No, he had one arm, but that was a different grandfather. He was illiterate. And he actually did not serve in the war. Max, how tall are you? 4'11"? My grandfather, was, as a grown man, was about the same height as Max. But he was a, he was a champion at something. He was a farmer, of course, and that's just like gambling. But he was also a lumberjack, and he was a champion log roller. Stand on the log and roll it in the water. He had a low, really low center of gravity, though. You know, he's only he's not five feet tall. Um, and he does not sign it. He makes his mark, and somebody witnesses his mark for him because he was illiterate. But notice the difference. Two years' time. Huge difference between the loyalty oath that um, Felder had to sign and Abner Perry, my great-grandfather, had to sign. By the way, that's not many generations from me, is it? How many is it? Two. Actually, it's three. My father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather. That's a lot of years, but it's not a lot of generations. Any of y'all, I don't know if I've asked you this. Any of y'all know your great grandfather? Okay. How old is he? Is he still alive? Okay. My daddy was 92 when he died. Older than your great grandfather is. Which is, it's not, it's kind of interesting, you know? Um, which tells you that men in my family tended to live for a long time. Except my grandfather. He died one day at lunch. He did. My my grand he was a farmer. My grandmother would cook lunch. That was the big meal of the day. And my grandfather Love would always come in from whatever he was doing in the day and eat lunch and then he'd go lay down and take a nap. Because you know he'd been up since the crack of dawn. And then he would get up and go finish whatever he needed to finish. Um one day he did that been asleep about an hour and my grandmother walked by the room and just noticed something was odd and walked in and he was dead. Yeah, I mean, he died, He literally died in his sleep. He really did. Anyway, um, this is a presidential pardon. I can guarantee you there's not another school in the state of Georgia that has a presidential pardon on their campus. We do. It's in our archives. Um, and in fact, we have the presidential signature of every president who served during the Civil War. That would be Abraham Lincoln. And every man who served in the Civil War and became a president. One of them's hanging right there. That one right there. Yep. President McKinley. William McKinley. Right there. I guarantee you there ain't another classroom in the state that's got one of those hanging in it. You're welcome. Here, let's, let's do this. There it is, right there. Um, it's in our archives. We just It's actually the commission of a man named A.B. Scott, um, who was the, our, common, our first commandant of cadets here at the school. And so when he died, his family left some things to us, and that was one of them. It's pretty cool. It's actually his commission into the United States Army. In 1898, Spanish-American War was going on. 
No. All right, so basically all this does is it forgives Jerry Cowles of Macon, Georgia, for anything he might have done during the rebellion. And it's signed by Andrew Johnson right here. Cowles actually dies six years later in the Great Chicago Fire. All right. So, what happens in Georgia? Reconstruction in Georgia. 1867. Remember, in 1865, they adopted a state constitution. They have to do it again in 1867. Why? Because they didn't do it right the first time. And so they have to adopt the new state constitution. One of the things that is different about this new constitution is that black men, for the first time ever, have the opportunity to make decisions about how they're going to be governed. 37 delegates are African American, and they work with their white counterparts to create a new constitution. 1868, there's an election. It's also a presidential election. It's a state and it's a presidential election. During that election, African Americans are elected for the first time. For the first time ever, black men in the state of Georgia have a say so in how they're going to be governed. And if you think about it, and I've gotten chills all day long as I've talked about this, for the first time ever, black men walked up the west steps of the Capitol building over here and entered the old Capitol building, not as slaves, not as men whose purpose is to go in and serve somebody in that building, but their purpose is to go in and serve the people of Georgia and represent them. And I still get chills. And I'm going to tell you this, if you don't get chills because of that, you're dead. You might as well lay down because you're dead. Because that was a moment in history that changed the world. Unfortunately, it didn't last very long. It'll come back, but it doesn't last very long. One of the men that's elected is named Henry McNeil Turner. Turner is elected to the House of Representatives and he will serve for a short period of time, and then he gets kicked out, along with every other black legislator. So here's what happens at the Constitutional Convention. Are there any Democrats at the Constitutional Convention in 1867? Shake your head no. No, sir, there were not. Max has this uncanny ability to always say the opposite of what I want him to say. But at least he speaks up. So no, there are no Democrats present. There are carpetbaggers. There are scalawags. And there are black folks. There are no white Democrats present. That in and of itself should give you um, some foresight that this is not going to last. But the, the convention does accomplish a couple of things. It creates a new constitution that ensures civil rights for all citizens. It guarantees a free public education for all children, black and white. And women, ladies, some good news for you. You are allowed to control your own property now. So if you own land and you decide to sell it, you don't have to have a man to do it. You are a strong, free, independent woman. And now you can live that way. So Georgia, everybody's happy. Congress is happy. Hey, good job, Georgia. Come on back. General Pope is happy because he no longer has to live in Georgia. He leaves, takes the army with him. It doesn't last. It just doesn't last. We're waiting on Hunter and Kai and Gonzalo. I know, I know, I know. I know. All right, here we go, because we've got a lot to do, a short period of time. All right, President Johnson, again, we saw that presidential pardon that he signed for Jerry Cowles. He signs those for a lot of people, thousands of people. 
Um, and then there are those who don't want a presidential pardon. Jubal Early, who's on the wall out here in our um, contest. Jubal Early's response to a presidential pardon was, I don't want a blankety-blank pardon. I don't need a blankety-blank pardon because I hadn't blankety-blankety-blankety-blankety-blankety-blankety-blankety-blankety-blankety done anything to deserve a pardon. So why would I want one? And there were people like that. They didn't feel like they'd done anything wrong. Want a pardon. So they lived the rest of their lives kind of in limbo. They're not a citizen of the U.S. It's almost like they were aliens, like someone who had immigrated to the U.S. They're not citizens, but they're living here. Talked about Henry McNeil Turner. There's a picture of um, Reverend Turner. He's a minister, and he's educated. He is not a self-taught man. He is actually educated. Um, and President Lincoln appoints him to be the first black chaplain in the United States Army. He's appointed or he's assigned to the U.S. Colored Troops. 180,000 men and he is their preacher. After the war, he works for the Freedmen's Bureau and becomes one of the founders of the Republican Party in Georgia. He is one of those men that walks up the western steps of the Capitol building and takes his seat in the Georgia General Assembly in the legislative chambers up there. <clears throat> Someone earlier today, or maybe it was yesterday, um, said that Mr. Turner looked Hispanic. No, nah, I don't see it. He, he doesn't have typical African-American features, though, does he? He really doesn't. Um, and that may have helped him at some point in time in his life. Um, it really doesn't help him in 1868, though. After the 1868 election, um, really within months, um, all the black legislators are thrown out of the General Assembly. The Democratic Party has begun to um, exert its influence and they are thrown out. They are expelled. Not only that, but hotel and business owners in Milledgeville will not house them, will not feed them. And so, the military commander, and it is not John Pope, just draw a line through that blank. It is not John Pope, but the military commander decides, okay, We'll move the capital to Atlanta. Partly in response to how Milledgeville has treated these black legislators, but more realistically, it was an economic decision. Atlanta is booming. Atlanta is being rebuilt. Atlanta is the transportation center of the state. And so the capital is moved to Atlanta. In 1870, the General Assembly is forced by the federal government to reseat those black legislators. So Henry McNeil Turner takes his seat in the state legislature for the second time. Are there black representatives elected to Georgia's General Assembly after that? Yes. There are, but it's well over 100 years after that. Yes. Major General John Pope, yes. All right. So, what are carpetbaggers and scallywags? Well, they're basically Republicans. And they're two different types. A carpetbagger is somebody who moved here from the North after the war. And they may or may not be political. But if they're political, they're Republicans. And they came South seeking office so they could make their fortune. And that in and of itself sounds wrong. You shouldn't be in politics to make money. But carpetbaggers were. They also wanted to take advantage of the economic rebuilding that was taking place. Scalawags were southern-born Republicans. Or they were northern Republicans who had lived here before the war. So what would you rather be, a carpetbagger or a scalawag? 
I'm with you. I think I'd rather be a scallywag. Ah, first of all, it sounds better, right? Sounds like a pirate. Arg, you scallywag. And there were many scallywags who did this. They had been Democrats before the war, during the war. I'm telling you. Even maybe slightly after the war. But then they decided, nah, you know what? I think I'm a Republican. And they did that so they could be elected to office. Joe Brown, who was the governor of Georgia during the Civil War, suddenly one day decided he was not a Democrat, he was a Republican. And so he's elected to office as a Republican. Reconstruction ends. Joe Brown says, I was just kidding. I'm really not a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I just said that so I could be elected to office. Well, why did people vote for Joe Brown? Well, he was a Republican, but they knew who he was, too. And that's the difference between a carpetbagger and a scalawag. Scalawag's from here anyway. A carpetbagger's not. So, um, the government of Georgia, controlled by the Republican Party, is definitely more scallywag than carpetbagger. Our representatives to Congress were more scallywag than carpetbagger. There are very few carpetbaggers who actually hold office in Georgia or in the U.S. Congress. In fact, there are none in Congress. You scallywag. Mm -hmm. All right, we ready? That'll show up on video. Sorry. All right, here we go. So, um, this kind of introduces us to something. In um, July, 30, uh, July 31st, 1868, there is a man named George Ashburn. He's a judge, and he is murdered. Ashburn was um, very vocal against secession. He um, raised and led a regiment of loyal Southerners during um, the war, in other words, they fought for the Union. He becomes a um, delegate to the Constitutional Convention in 1867. He's one of those Republicans that's there. And he supports Congressional Reconstruction. And that made him a target for the KKK. So on July 31st, 1868, he's in a hotel room in Columbus, Georgia. There's a knock at his door, and a group of men barge in, weapons drawn, to shoot George Ashburn to death. And it really becomes the first noticed, if I can use that word, murdered by the KKK. And it goes downhill from there. Um, carpetbagger, he is just cheesy looking, isn't he? Yeah. Um, state capital has moved to Georgia, 1868. Um, this is actually the Atlanta City Hall. It serves as the Capitol building in Georgia for a year. Then in 1869, it's moved to the Kimball Opera House, and it's there for the next 20 years. In 1889, the Capitol moves to its present location. We're actually going March the 29th to the Capitol. Um, well, yeah, it's a field trip. Um, you'll be in class A and you will enjoy it. Because I said so, that's why. All right. Um, Henry Turner becomes a target of the KKK. Um, they try to intimidate him, they try to use terror. Um, they never use violence against Turner, but he's on their radar. The Klan is founded in 1865 by Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. He's on the wall out here. Um, 
And it is originally started as a secret organization to uh, provide veterans of the Confederate War an opportunity to get together and be social with one another, to drink and tell stories. That's basically what it boils down to. And had that been the end of it, had that been its real true purpose, that would have been fine. But unfortunately for people of the South, the KKK becomes a way for Southerners to resist Reconstruction. And they do that through scare tactics, terror methods, violence, murder, all intended to intimidate people who weren't like them, who didn't think like they did. Blacks, Republicans, members of the Freedmen's Bureau, anybody that was in favor of Reconstruction would and could become a part, a target of the KKK. In essence, the Ku Klux Klan becomes the terrorist arm of the Democratic Party. And they help the Democratic Party regain control of the South. We don't need to hurry. Because I got 10 minutes to do 11 minutes worth of work. All right, here we go. So, Nathan Bedford Forrest, you can find him out there. He is a racist. He is a pro-slavery guy. He's just a mean, rotten, nasty individual. Um, do you get the idea? Here's how mean, rotten, and nasty he was. In 1864, Fort Pillow was attacked by Nathan Bedford's men. Um, they win the battle, 293 Mostly African-American troops are captured and summarily executed. Just as a matter of fact, just rounded up and killed. Even though they had surrendered, which technically is a war crime. Nathan Bedford Forrest, of course, has never tried for that. Um, but that becomes part of his legacy. And you can see how somebody like that would want to start an organization intended to terrorize people. All right. Um, you could be a, even though it's a secret organization, you could have your membership card in the Klan. And, of course, they dress to disguise themselves. They don't want to be known because that kind of contributes to the fear. You don't know who they are. Could be the grocery store guy. Could be... Your sheriff could be one of the deacons in your church. Be your next door neighbor. You don't know who it is. And they even go so far as to disguise their horses. Why? Horses have distinguishing marks just like people do. Might have a star in the middle of their forehead or a white forelock or whatever. And so they disguise because that's part of the fear. And of course, uh, they join with other organizations um, and one of the big things they do is they don't want black folks to vote. John B. Gordon, um, pictured here, was a lieutenant general in the Confederate Army. On the right, he's out here too. He was the governor of Georgia, and more than likely he is the head of the Ku Klux Klan while he's the governor of Georgia. Um, was shot in the face, and that's why you never see him turn the other way. 
every photograph after the Civil War that you would see of him, um, you don't really see the left side of his face. You can kind of see it here. Got a dent. Yeah. Um, but under John B. Gordon, the black man did not stand a chance. So Georgia's readmitted, or are they? December of 1865, they are readmitted to the Union. They've um, ratified the 13th Amendment, done what they were supposed to do. They've elected senators. They've elected representatives. They sent them to Washington, D.C. But in March of 1867, the Reconstruction Act is signed into law, um, and Georgia's kicked out. They're readmitted again in July of 1868, and then they're kicked out in March of 1869 because they removed blacks from office and some other things. Um, December of 1869, the Army comes back to Georgia and takes charge. Georgia finally gets it right, and in July of 1870, uh, they're readmitted for the third and final time, and they are the last Confederate state to be readmitted to the Union. All right, so one of the reasons they are placed under military rule again for the second time is because of the KKK. In September of 1868, there's an event called the Camilla Massacre. Men and women are gathering um, for a Republican um, get-together in Camilla, and they are met by the KKK and they are murdered. Georgia does not vote for Ulysses S. Grant in November of 1868, one of two southern states that do not. That had nothing to do with military rule coming back, but it's just an interesting fact. Rufus Bullock, who's the Republican governor, engineers or creates an environment where the 15th Amendment does not pass. And he does that on purpose. And you might think, why would a Republican governor do that? He had a mess on his hands, and he didn't know what to do. He thought the easiest way, the surefire way to get things right is to have the military come back in and take charge, and they do. Um, Congress kicks out Georgia's representatives and senators, and in December of 1869, the Army comes back, and Georgia is out of the Union once again. Well, it certainly was a record. Well, other states had similar problems, but it doesn't take them three times to be readmitted. I got to go. We got to go. All right. So, um, Reconstruction ends. Those men who had been kicked out of office are readmitted um, in 1870, Georgia Supreme Court says that it was illegal what had been done to them, and so they take their seats in the legislature. They approve the 14th and the 15th Amendments, and Georgia is readmitted again in July of 1870. It says 71, but it was 1870. Um, and that ends Reconstruction in Georgia. Reconstruction in the South continues on for another six years. Um, ending in 1877. All right. Um, this is a study guide. It's not like previous study guides. There are no um, questions for you to answer. Ex and, well, there are some questions for you to answer. Please don't forget your rating at 2.30 in the gold chain. Thank you. No. I need to finish this. Okay. So what you have on the front page is basically an outline of what we've studied regarding Reconstruction, um, things you need to know. And then there are five short answer questions, and I need to talk to you about those. Okay? Those five short answer questions, if you read the instructions, it says this. Answer the following questions completely as you possibly can. Write in complete sentences following the standards of written English. Record your answers in the space provided or on notebook paper. Pretend you are in English class. 
be professional. Now, what do I mean by pretend you're in English class? If you go into English class, Major Janakis gives you a writing prompt and says, I want you to write an essay and this is your prompt. Don't go anywhere. What's your first step? What's the first thing you're going to write? What? You're going to restate the question or really you're writing a thesis sentence, right? Is that what you're doing? I want you to treat this the same way. Now, you're not going to write, I, you know, back in the day it was a five-paragraph essay or five-paragraph. I'm not asking you to do that, but I'm asking you to treat it that way. Here's my introduction, here's the meat, and here's my conclusion. Here's my ending. So approach it that way. And I think your writing is going to become much better if you will do that. Okay? Um, work on those tonight. We'll go over those tomorrow. Your test is 50 multiple choice and then something else. But I can guarantee you, you're going to see those five questions again. Again.